Chris. My name is Chris, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, street level imagery as open data. If I can change slides. Uh, I got stuck on my slide. Hang on. Mm. Okay. So, when we talk about data, there are many different kinds. Not all data is geospatial. We know this very well. Sometimes we're opening a, a table-based piece of data, uh, something that's a CSV, and you need to do table joins in order to join it to the map, associate it with points or polygons. But most of us uh, are here because we're talking about things like location data. We're talking about spatial data, geodata. We have all these different words for it. And most of all, we like to talk about open data. And this is an important part of the FOS4G world, because you have the software, you have the people, but it's all built around making sense of this data. But we don't always think of photos as data. Going back to old school photos, uh, something taken with a camera on film, a lot of these are now a form of data that's still accessible to a lot of us. Uh, and when we use a digital camera or something on our telephone, uh, on the mobile phone, with action cameras like a GoPro, you're getting a lot more than just the visual information. So we can interpret the photographs to create information, and we can do something like derive data from them just by looking at them. Uh, but one of the most important things for us in the geospatial world is looking at the geotag of an image. So people will do this with things like Twitter. Uh, you'll see it with all kinds of different social media apps. You'll see it with things like Flickr, where suddenly the photo becomes relevant to the map. But you also have more information inside of uh, something like a JPEG. So you can get pixel values, uh, you can get the timestamp, which is very correlated to the geotag, uh, and overall we call this the EXIF. And the EXIF uh, was short for, I forgot it now too. But uh, <laughs> essentially what this is, is it's something that if you're working with photographs a lot, it's what you're actually analyzing. And if you're working with geotag photos, then accessing the EXIF is kind of the first step to actually opening up that photo and getting under the hood. And when we want to take uh, that data and share it, when we want to make it open, we're often dealing with open data portals. So this is very common for us uh, when we're working on a project. We say, okay, I need data about uh, land cover, I need data about uh, something in biogeography, where do I get it? So you're going off into a government website or somewhere that has uh, a repository of data. So it's often a government service. And when you access a government open data portal, you're often seeing a, uh, a variety of different file types available to you there. Let's see. Let's see if I can get this to load my next images here. So here, for example, we're looking at the Swiss Open Data Portal. And you can see categories, you can see keywords. Uh, if you scroll down later, you also see things like different file types. And they're not all shapefiles. Uh, some of these are zips. You have CSVs, uh, a JSON, but it's not a GeoJSON. So it's not always geodata, but geodata is definitely a growing part of these repositories. And for many of us, it's the reason we visit them. Uh, you also have things like imagery inside of these, uh, these open data repositories. But often when we're thinking about imagery, people are thinking about something aerial. So here's from the city of Buenos Aires. You have uh, aerial photography as one of the first results when I search for photography, photographia. And that's also from a camera, but it's, uh, it's something that's been around for a long time. Like We expect that often as a government service that Maybe your city or your, your country is capturing uh, annual aerial imagery, or even uh, someone like NASA is sharing satellite imagery, and it's a public good. But aside from this, you have uh, just regular photos, just the ones from our perspective on the ground. 
And it's interesting to look at how these can be shared as open data and how it, uh, how it gets interpreted. So let's see. The example you see here, uh, this is a photograph. And it was taken by a Swiss photographer. You can see in the description, uh, he started, I think this was the late 1800s was when he was capturing these. Uh, so it looks like his name was Adolf Braun. Beautiful photographs of Switzerland. And these were digitized and they're now shared on the Swiss Open Data Portal. Uh, these aren't necessarily geotagged, however. So you have a form of photography as open data, but you don't have it as geodata. So there's a next step there. Uh, and some people have taken these steps, but let's bounce back to imagery as geodata. Another great example is open aerial map. Uh, this imagery you see here is from Zanzibar. So there are groups in Zanzibar who are capturing drone imagery. They share it here, and people are able to tile it onto OpenStreetMap, for example, and then start mapping things like building outlines, roads, paths, uh, and other geographic features. So it's both imagery that already is geospatially associated, as well as a resource that you can use to actually uh, drill down with human eyes and start extracting more geospatial information from it. So we looked at the, the photograph from Switzerland, and that's historical imagery, it's open data. And on the left here, you'll see from the National Library of Denmark, uh, another historical photograph that's being shared openly on their website. And it's been digitized from a time before you could upload and geotag photos. Uh, but suddenly, the difference here is, not only can you compare it with a modern image, which you see on the right, but both of these are geotagged. So both of these you can actually find on Mapillary. There's a small watermark in the corner of each one of them. And what's interesting is one of the uh, Mapillary ambassadors based in Copenhagen, or the Copenhagen area, he was able to take all the digitized photos and start trying to match them with the correct locations on the ground. And the next step is you could then compare them with photos that another user, uh, like Peter Neubauer of Mapillary, was able to go out and capture with his mobile phone. And the matching starts to happen automatically at a point, uh, which we'll get into on uh, more of a technological discussion here. But overall, these are available on the same platform, side by side, and treated as the same type of data. So they're totally from different eras. They're totally from different devices. Uh, the first one on the left was never intended to be shared this way. You were never supposed to pull it up in Chrome back when it was captured in something like 1890. But here it is. So this concept of imagery being open data, especially imagery coming from government repositories or government resources uh, captured by government, a lot of it came to become a form of open data that we use to fix maps by complete accident. And if you know Bob Ross, he likes to call them happy little accidents. And our happy little accident uh, happened a few years ago. So Stephen works for the Vermont uh, Transportation Agency. And Stephen advertised on Twitter that he was uh, just having fun doing some analysis with data he had found. You can see it on the map. And he said, these points are from 2012 and 2013. Each photo is about 400 kilobytes. Blah, blah, blah. But the data set is almost 2 million points, each one representing an image on Vermont's roads. So this is the highway system. And he asks, is this interesting to anyone? So a shot in the dark, a tweet in the open, and I happened to see this, and I said, hey, I have an idea. We'd love to uh, talk to you more about what you're doing with this imagery. So he had a drawer full of hard drives, and it does go back to 1998, which is a huge amount of data, but we took uh, a couple years of this data. We were able to uh, have it shipped to us at Mapillary. And because each one of these images was already geotagged, we were able to start putting them on the map and stitching them together into a street level imagery experience. And this is kind of totally different than they ever expected to do. Originally they were 
just capturing these in utility trucks from the government, and they'd use it to review the condition of the roadways. But they didn't really have a larger purpose in mind as far as sharing it or letting other people repurpose it. So this kind of led to a bit of a triangle, the open data triangle that uh, I work in a lot with my own experiences. So Mapillary is not a provider of street level imagery. We are more of a, a bridge between people who go out with cameras and capture it and people who want to consume it for some special purpose or project. Sometimes it's the same people, but they need a bridge between their camera or their hard drive and their actual web applications or desktop GIS. Uh, sometimes it's the OpenStreetMap community and they're repurposing images, for example, from Vermont. So uh, on OpenStreetMap, you have access to this imagery as well as data derived from it. And ideally, we connect that triangle on one final step where governments actually start to embrace OSM as a valid base map uh, rather than something that's much older or more sparse or less frequently updated. So hopefully, they're giving out imagery, we're making it available, and people are using it, creating a map, and it completes uh, it continues the cycle so that it's worthwhile to keep capturing more imagery, keep updating that map, uh, and keep using the map. So Vermont's the first example of uh, what started this conversation about governments using Mapillary to share imagery as open data. But we want to ask, okay, who else is doing it? Well, very quickly there were many more, and to this day that list is increasing. So in North America, you have several different states. Uh, these are all state departments of transportation, uh, as well as you have cities. Uh, for example, the city of Detroit, which is also editing OpenStreetMap from the uh, mapillary imagery, uh, and then reusing it. So it's that triangle we talked about. And in Canada as well, you have cities like Saskatoon or St. John's. And it goes on through Europe. Uh, we have several in Oceania and Australia. And even in South America, the National Transport Agency of Brazil, which drives vast amounts of roads through a very large country, uh, they also are using cameras to capture this roadway. So suddenly, this is becoming uh, open data available as well. So imagine editing OpenStreetMap in the Amazon in places that are very hard to reach but there are some roads that go through there and suddenly you have uh, not just one, but many, many hundreds of images uh, just in one small stretch of a road on the ground uh, and frequently up to date. So you can see some example images on the right of what it looks like on the ground in each of these places. Uh, these are each taken from Mapillary and they're all from the user account of the administration you'll see on the left side there. So we talked a little bit about VTrans, and in Vermont, they had a purpose for capturing that imagery originally, which was roadway maintenance. And a lot of people ask, you know, when this huge volume of imagery does come into Mapillary suddenly in their country. Uh, maybe you're living in Lithuania, and one day you log in to Mapillary or OpenStreetMap, uh, and you find that there's imagery available in 360 degrees of all the roads, and it's only from last year which is very different from many other street level providers that are five years old or three years old. And you're asking why are they doing this? What's the incentive for them to actually go out there with a camera and what's the incentive to, to upload it? So from a perspective of government transportation agency, the imagery is helping to document sometimes the work that you're doing. Uh, maybe you're putting in fiber optic cables along a roadside and you need to have imagery that shows that you finished covering them back up with pavement. Uh, and then when you also are doing something like analyzing the road condition across the country, you're in a GIS tool and you need quickly to take a look at uh, what mile marker or, or kilometer marker number 75 looks like on the ground. You can get an image that you know is located near that marker and has a camera angle facing toward it. So this is hard to do in practice. Uh, many of these organizations had uh, applications that were just kind of strung together by their own office, uh, but less than satisfactory, or were using enterprise applications that were very expensive, but 
not really tailored to their needs. And a lot of them were also looking at commercial street imagery providers. And they'd say, well, it's outdated. Um, we want to just see what this house looks like at this address, but the image is from 2012. We're going to go out and capture our own imagery. So among these reasons and many more, all these agencies are looking for a way to just enrich their GIS by actually getting a visual on the ground. Like we often think of the map, uh, similar to the quote, the map is not the territory. We think of it in our heads. We sometimes uh, find yourself dreaming of it overnight, the polygons and the, the road lines running through, and you realize, OK, that's me thinking about the city I live in, but from this uh, theoretical perspective that's me and QGIS, instead of uh, looking at it the way it is when you walk down the street. So sometimes when you're editing the map, you actually want that real world perspective, and this is it. There are other uses as well, things like automated data collection or even manual. Uh, you can step through in your office and mark the location of crosswalks just by seeing images that are geotagged near them. So those uses, uh, they, they cross a lot of different boundaries and there's always new purposes being invented. But one of the most important pieces is also inventing new tools. So you can see here the uh, QGIS plugin. This is called GoToMapillary. Uh, so this was made by an architect in Italy, Enrico Ferguti. And he was making this as a personal project because he needed to see what the buildings looked like in an area he was working. And suddenly, it was shared as an open source plugin. And now you can pull Mapillary into uh, this GIS tool and add your own imagery as well. Uh, you can view it on the Mapillary website. You can view it across a wide range of OpenStreetMap editors, uh, as well as any kind of proprietary GIS tools like ArcGIS. You can view it in the Here Map Creator and many other custom web and mobile applications. So the goal here overall is getting the imagery online is one thing. Getting people who have huge volumes of imagery online is another and then making it available to reintegrate into creative scenarios, uh, that's where you get developer resources. So in my own work, I'm often helping people who have imagery or know where the imagery is that they want to use. Many of these are government entities. And they're saying, OK, we have it, but we want to use it in a very specific way. And so using resources like this, uh, you're able to then integrate it. So at the top right, you see uh, open structure for motion, open SFM. So this is an open source library that Mapillary provides and it helps you recreate 3D scenes based on the pixels in that street level imagery. And the bottom right you see just the very basic example code uh, just for using the Mapillary viewer. So you can throw this inside of a, a JavaScript application and with these few lines you already are able to visualize an image uh, and connect it to your map. So the goal is to make this very easy, uh, alongside with how easy we like to make it for uploading that imagery. So finally, I want to talk about the future uh, of Mapillary and as the street level imagery as open data. So one is we want to enable more ways to capture. So there's a lot of imagery out there that's not getting uploaded because it's not geotagged or people just don't know how to connect it to the methods for uploading. Um, but this includes just expanding the number of mobile phone applications that are able to submit images to Mapillary, uh, connecting automotive sensors, and also just enabling better support for more advanced cameras, 360 degree cameras, for example. The more uh, historical imagery we get, we also can get more comparisons over time, which uh, can lead to a lot of new learnings. And we also will get imagery on new road types, not always just highways or city streets, but even in residential areas, train tracks, footpaths. So, and that leads into really a question of mapping what's uh, beyond commercially viable. And governments often take responsibility for this. Uh, mapping vulnerable communities, mapping in developing countries, uh, or even grassroots level mapping led by citizens and communities rather than government industry, uh, such as the Map 2020 initiative. 
So overall, uh, I just want to encourage you to take a look at this timeline and ask about the future of who the providers of street-level imagery are. Uh, in the past, it's been proprietary. You can see uh, like Google Street View in 2007. But people were doing this even before then, like 1998 in Vermont, just without the idea of what it could become. So now as we go into 2019, we see there are many, many, many sources, including 2018 across multiple cities, uh, organizations like Bike Ottawa, who does bike advocacy. Uh, GeoChicas has many mapping projects going on. All of these are new providers that are independent of any kind of large company. And in 2020, we want to look at who else can contribute, who else can consume the imagery, uh, and how it will be shared. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. So we have about maybe three minutes for questions. Um, so if you did plan to go to another session, we'll have to kind of juggle the two. So stick your hand up and I'll bring the mic around if you have a question for Chris. Might have to give this to the person asking the question. Any questions for Chris? Okay, thank you Chris. Got one. I've got one. Uh, did you do any regional analysis with the images, you know, like uh, on a map to see like, okay, there's this type of uh, uh, buildings or this type of roads. Have you used it in this way? Like with image classification? Get it on the stream. Uh, yeah, we did. We've done some really interesting things about the content of the images. Uh, roughly, you can actually just tell what percentage of an image is classified in a certain category, like buildings, uh, roads, or road markings. So one exciting example that I want to share more work on is just mapping urban footprints in the Galapagos Islands. You can start to classify if the imagery is containing more urban things like wire groups, power lines, or roads, or if it's more like vegetation and, uh, and bare earth. So there's a lot of that data available, but we also don't specifically provide that as any kind of information, we just make it available for someone to work with. Any other questions for Chris? Cool. All right, thank you. Take care.